today's topic like you've said uh, it's it's everywhere from you know 12 years back this word was an alien to you know most of us majority of us i would say cryptocurrency bitcoin virtual digital assets non fungible tokens metaverse and ethereum usd tether these blockchain decentralized finance smart contracts these terms were all alien to us you know going 12 years back or you know 10 years back today is these top today these topics have gained enough importance tremendous importance i would say the reason behind the same is changing dynamics this boom is because of the fact that technology is supreme and the only thing which is you know the constant is the change we say change is the only thing which is constant so changes do come dynamism do come technological changes happen and virtual digital assets cryptocurrencies blockchain and you know non fungible tokens etc the terms that i've just used few minutes back is all a by product of these changes i am a chartered accountant working in international tax advisory vertical at one of the top consulting firms in india by the name of akm global we are a firm established in the year 1981 currently headquartered in gurgaon we have branches span india and even outside india in gurgaon office there are 200 plus employees from diverse backgrounds accounting tax legal management secretarial most of our clients are multinational corporations 90% of them i would say from more than i would say you know 35 plus countries we have a strong media presence including you know we you know views of the senior partners of the firm getting published in reputed uh, media newspapers such as economic times business standard live mint etc we uh, you know are ranked consistently by international tax review in the world tax and world transfer pricing guidelines from 2017 till 2022 each year consistently so international tax review is the only ranking system which is recognized uh, worldwide coming to the topic virtual digital assets why to tax fine fine virtual digital assets have come in blockchain technology is there decentralized finance is there we as a community we have started trusting these tokens these new ways of you know dealing with each other transacting with each other okay great but why to tax because there are high stakes involved india is the you know the most uh, as is at the top is is one of the countries which is on the top when it comes to crypto investments crypto investors these are all reported in media all in public domain the snapshots are in front of you all crypto technology industry is expected to grow to 241 million dollars by 2030 as per nascom it's an insane figure india worldwide ranks second in terms of crypto adoption like we have adopted crypto massively we have the highest number of crypto owners so these all things are happening which has actually led government to shift from outrightly banning it to somewhere bringing up a regime to tax it they have also i think seen an opportunity by you know uh, getting tax revenues from these new age income streams like i've just said 12 years back these all words were in alien we could not think 
that you know 10 years down the line or you know back in 2010 and 2020 22 something like this will be on the rise and there will be so much of investment I mean billions of dollars would be there in this space let's look at the india's journey before deliberating on the taxation aspects and even the technical aspects by the way this all originated in a nutshell by 20, 2008 wherein a white paper by satoshi nakamoto who is satoshi nakamoto nobody knows who he is nobody knows where he is even i do not know it's a pseudonym name given on a white paper con you know which has the technical concepts technical details about the bitcoin this paper was published by the name of bitcoin a peer to peer electronic cash system 2010 first sale of bitcoin took place wherein can you imagine someone ate two pizzas and gave 10000 bitcoins in lieu of that while just settling off the amount which the person knows after eating two pizzas in a restaurant and you know buy 10000 bitcoins you know nobody could not even imagine in 2010 that what the person is doing is the person doing correct thing while giving 10,000 bitcoins or if the, if, is the person accepting it, accepting it a fool or why, 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 what is the essence of the, what is the essence of this transaction at, at large? What is the nature of this transaction? Why is this transaction even happening? Nobody could, you know, uh, most of us could not even, you know, see the rationale behind this transaction, but this actually, it's actually true. It's, it's in the, it's in the public domain coming to the the reserve bank of india and the india stand from 2013 till 2020 i would say 2020 things changed in terms of cryptocurrency adoption in terms of these new age digital assets we were in a you know we were in a cautious phase or i would say warning phase a government is having discomfort and it is still having discomfort when it comes to adopting cryptocurrencies. It is still not a legal tender in India. So RBI was continuously issuing circulars, warning, you know, Indians of the potential risks associated while transacting in such virtual currencies, you know, press releases by RBI, even, you know, in March, 2018, a draft scheme was submitted by the central board of direct taxes as well to the finance ministry for you know uh, in in consonance with the circular restraining the banking banking system banks nbfcs and payment systems payment providers from dealing in the virtual currencies in 2018 a very popular crypto exchange wazirx's ceo mr nishal shetty started a campaign hashtag india wants crypto so the idea was to create awareness in Indians for these, for this uh, new age asset class. 2020, Supreme Court strikes down or quashes the RBI circular. What was that RBI circular all about, which after quashing by the Supreme Court changed the game of crypto industry in India? So the RBI circular, to summarize, was about that it restricted the banking facilities to the persons who want to facilitate transactions in cryptocurrencies that there is that no bank should support these transactions in simple words the circular was about this supreme court just quashed the circular on the constitutional grounds that it is the fundamental right of anyone to do business any you to do the business the way he she wants or the do business the cryptocurrency exchanges wants so it, it, the circular was squashed. 2021 Indian government continued with its discomforting stand on these virtual currencies, virtual digital assets. And they came up with a draft bill proposing a blanket ban on the cryptocurrencies in India. While they wanted to bring up, they wanted to bring up a, you know, a new currency, sovereign backed currency by Indian government and consequent subsequently putting a blanket ban 
this bill has not been tabled in the parliament so far nothing has no needle has moved so far on this bill and it's uh, all a draft bill right now 2022 honorable finance minister nirmala sitaraman ji while giving the budget speech announced the direct tax regime for virtual digital assets let me tell you the virtual digital assets is defined in 2 clause 47a of indian income tax act 1961 through finance act 2022 but this definition has been largely taken from the draft bill which was which came in 2019 to ban the cryptocurrencies not entirely largely taken from that draft bill let's come at what is a vda what is a virtual digital asset let's read this definition it's very important for the deliberation going forward it means is an exhaustive definition it does not mention includes it mentions means any information or code or number or token so four components any any information or code or number or token generated through cryptographic means find a technology which is there to generate cryptocurrencies or otherwise the word otherwise is even if any information code or number or token generated through non cryptographic means is also a vda if 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 i go by this definition the plain vanilla meaning of this definition by whatever name called providing a digital representation of value this is an important feature digital representation of value exchanged with or without consideration with the promise or representation of having inherent value can someone say people say satoshi nakamoto invented bitcoin nobody knows who he is nobody knows where he is where does he live and who is he basically but still people just you know in 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 you know uh, say that he invented bitcoin no we cannot say that because it's just a name pseudonym name given to the white paper on bitcoin in 2009 can new age assets like cryptocurrencies non fungible tokens have inherent value it's a very interesting question i'll come to that later in the later part of our slides inherent value and we have to appreciate the wording of the definition with the promise or representation of having inherent value or functions as a store of value or a unit of account including its use in any financial transaction any financial transaction or investment you use it in any financial transaction or you do an investment but not limited to investment scheme i'll tell you why they have mentioned this but not limited to investment scheme in the later part of our slides but this definition is quite beautiful i would say very beautifully worded they have made this definition all encompassing i would say and can be transferred stored or traded electronically whatever act you do of concerning any information or code or number or token which is generated through any means by whatever name called forget about cryptographic means it says through cryptographic means or otherwise by whatever name called it's a vda coming to part b a non fungible token or any other token of similar nature by whatever name called 
the interesting part is that what was the need to actually insert part B to 247A in the form of a separately mentioning non-fungible token there when they've already mentioned any information or code or a number or a token generated through cryptographic means or otherwise. The intent behind this seems to be that they want to treat non-fungible tokens as a separate asset class. Non-fungible tokens, the way they have picked up their pace, you know, is phenomenal, is like unimaginable. Coming to see any other digital asset, as the central government may by notification specify, they are not sparing. They know it's an ever changing dynamic technology called less blockchain. It's not just cryptocurrency they want to tax, it's not just non fungible token or Ether or Ripple or USD Tether. Any any new age asset class which may get spared through clause A can get covered in clause C, provided that the central government may exclude any digital asset as well. That's fine. They may exclude any digital asset. This exclusion or this proviso has come in because of, I would say, you know, central bank digital currency has been announced by Honorable Finance Minister Nimla Sitaramanji during the budget speech as well, wherein India will release its own CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency, on the basis of the blockchain technology. So this proviso will help the government in excluding that CBDC from VDA. Maybe this is my view. One is free to take the view. Non-fungible tokens, as per the explanation to this section 247A, 2 clause 47A, center government has in the explanation clearly mentioned that we will define non-fungible tokens. Do not worry, we will do that work for you. Do not consider that non-fungible tokens is a VDA. We'll define it for you. But this definition has not yet come. This notification has not yet come. Non-fungible tokens are basically our unique files that live on the blockchain technology. Even the entire system of cryptocurrency, Ether, non-fungible tokens, they live and thrive on blockchain technology. No blockchain, no cryptocurrency, no non-fungible tokens. Though non-fungible tokens are in a simple language programming programming codes, which is a popular programming language to create an NFT is Solidity. One of the popular programming languages to create an NFT is Solidity. So a notification for non-fungible tokens has to come by central government. They have inserted an explanation to this definition. So the intent is to treat NFTs separately because they are all booming like anything. Another explanation is on currency. Obviously, they'll have to be very clear with the wordings of the section that Indian currency is not a VDA. Indian currency, the sovereign backed currency is not a virtual digital asset or any foreign currency in uh, as per section two of foreign exchange management act 999 is also not a VDA. This may create a controversy. We all know that one of the countries recently, or it has been some months now that has announced Bitcoin as a legal tender, El Salvador, it's a country. So if foreign currency and an Indian currency is out of VDA prima facie after referring to the explanation to section two clause 47 a can we say the legal tender in the El Salvador is Bitcoin 
can that state you know just by giving a status of a legal tender by el salvador will help bitcoin enter into a category of foreign currency for the purposes of foreign exchange uh, foreign exchange regulations in india it's an interesting point but i think no because it's ultimately a code or a token formed through cryptographic means let's you know deek i have tried to decode the definition for you all like this definition like i've just told you it is taken largely from the draft banning of cryptocurrency and regulation of official digital currency bill 2019 which came way back before union budget 2022 in that bill i i tell you that it was written cryptocurrency means any information or code virtual digital asset word was nowhere there in that draft bill so they have widened the definition made it all encompassing the way i have just mentioned so important criteria is any information code or token generated through cryptographic means or otherwise this otherwise is very interesting this reflects that even a cryptocurrency or even a token formed through non cryptographic means form vda can cover can get covered under vda can be transferred stored or traded electronically fine providing a digital representation with the promise or representation of having inherent value so interestingly before coming to point number 5 i would say point 1 2 and 3 they are mandatorily required to be seen before characterizing any new age asset like cryptocurrency or nft as a vda point number 4 and 5 they are optional even you know any one of those conditions may get fulfilled and you may characterize that as a characterize characterize that asset as a vda but 1 2 and 3 should be read together as mandatory criteria or mandatory checklists to qualify an asset as a vda 4 and 5 can read as options to each other if not 4 check 5 if not 5 check 4 and it cannot happen that 4 on 5 both will not apply it will not happen i'm telling you either of them will definitely apply is indian currency or a foreign currency a vda already mentioned indian currency is not a vda they are our notes simple rupee notes issued by the reserve bank of india signed by the honorable governor of the reserve bank of india if a foreign currency a vda what does the foreign currency mean foreign currency as per the foreign exchange regulations of india means any currency other than indian currency like united states dollars like pound sterling like guinea peso like japanese yen all sovereign backed interesting point we all watch netflix we all watch prime hotstar we all you know listen to audio books we all attend webinars we pay for the subscriptions we have uh, you know uh, we we do online shopping can subscriptions to these ott platforms mobile applications e-commerce platforms be covered under vdas why i am telling you don't just go by what i have written they cannot get they cannot be covered under virtual digital assets why these are all you know formed through programmed codes whatever transaction you are doing on amazon or whatever transaction you are doing on netflix of taking a subscription it's all programmed 
it's all a programming language behind the same why can why can't we say that this subscription transaction or a netflix transaction is a is a vda we cannot say that because they're not you know uh, i would say they they do not they cannot be characterized as assets can you say i have a netflix subscription it is my asset no you cannot right coming to a very important point here of an inherent value i told you that can vdas have inherent value when they say that cryptocurrencies are not bagged no government has announced it as their legal tender even indian government forget about everyone even indian government our government is having discomfort this much of discomfort that they have levied a higher tax rate of 30% on it so if there is a degree of discomfort there is a degree of you know there if there are trust issues with the technology if it is completely decentralized we place so much of trust on our banking system i know that my money is there in the icici bank or an hdfc bank or an xyz abc bank for that matter any nationalized bank my money is safe this much of surety this much of trust is in the minds of indians and we indians place trust as our utmost priority we function on trust if we trust it we go about it and if we do not trust it we always have second thoughts about it be it anything so coming to inherent value why i am placing so much of thrust on this aspect is if i go back on the definition of 2 clause 47a of virtual digital asset it says with the promise or it says with the promise or representation of having inherent value if if my cryptocurrency or if my ether or if my nft is representing inherent value it's a vda how it's a vda if it is if if it is not backed if it is not recognized as legal if there is so much confusion so much of ambiguity around the world why i'll tell you why there is an ini- there is an interesting term of initial coin offerings icos similar to ipos for companies in the crypto world it's an ico it's the from the company point of view it's an ipo initial coin offerings like you know you remember satoshi naka mr satoshi nakamoto a white paper was released back in 2009 what was that it was a proof that crypto or a bitcoin may have an inherent value that is why that is why this inherent value word is very important in this definition that whenever you apply for initial coin offerings you have to come out with a white paper what is white paper white paper is a paper which consists of all the technical details all the underlying concepts of the assets everything about the project by project i mean a blockchain project these tokens are nothing but there are several projects on blockchain which are running ethereum is running on ethereum blockchain bitcoin is running on bitcoin blockchain so they have to come out with a white paper in us there is securities exchange commission as popularly known as sec or you know other agency they have to submit this white paper having concept technical details everything about the project blockchain project underlying that virtual digital asset 
these all points lead to the fact that virtual digital assets may have an inherent value associated with it that's why this inherent value word is mentioned in this definition because prima facie it seems that if nobody is recognizing it as even legal how can someone say that it has some inherent value to it so this is the reason that why inherent value word is mentioned so that there should not be a uh, any loophole that you know a, a, a an asset should go out of the vda coming to non fungible tokens i am telling you non fungible tokens is the next chapter in the history of art what happens uh, what used to happen earlier it's a, it was a quite popular practice super rich used to buy wall paintings antique wall paintings mf hussein horses a popular painting which every indian must have heard of in his lifetime at least once horses of hussein sub so super rich used to buy these things now like i have said technology is changing everything is digital even you can buy a virtual land even you know hnm store has completely uh, you know come up with their virtual store where you can uh, sit in a, in your cabin and travel the entire or you know hang around the entire hnm store technology is fast changing even you know that fast which is much faster than even the word fast i would say non fungible tokens they have picked up a phenomenal speed after a sale of beeple what beeple is is one of the popular it was one of the popular news all over when this beeple was sold this is beeple a collection of photos collection of artwork combined into one programmed into a coding language using languages like solidity etc and marketing it making you a owner of it of a unique painting or a unique artwork like beeple it was sold for 69 million dollars by a digital asset uh, digital artist sorry mike winkelman this was the turning point of non fungible tokens we have been doing practically lots of advisories tax advisories i would say on non fungible tokens and for cryptocurrency exchanges for the popular cryptocurrency exchanges i can tell you one thing there is a lot to come this space is actually booming a lot both from the tax for both from the technical sides and the taxation aspect and even the legal regulation aspect of it interestingly only the taxation regime has been announced so far they are you cannot say that they're legal nothing has been clarified or nothing has come up from the government's end to say that it's a regulated space it's not as of now only a tax regime has been announced types of virtual digital assets virtual digital asset definition itself has been worded in such a wide manner with provisos and explanations to it that central government will also notify the asset which may be excluded or the central government will by notification come up with the definition of a non fungible token it is itself an information or a code or token digital representation even of inherent value has been covered stored traded electronically everything has been mentioned whatever best possible this definition can be worded 
this definition has been worded in this very wide and all-encompassing manner. So what are the types of VDAs? Cryptos, Ether, USD, Tether, or NFTs, are these the types of VDAs? No, these are not the types of VDAs. There is no standard classification. One cannot say that this is the classification, A, B, C, and D. These are the type A VDAs, type B, type C, type D. No, you cannot say that because it's not possible. It's a fast changing technological environment, fast changing. Most, you know, by the time we are speaking, by the time we are attending this webinar, I can say an N number of blockchain projects must have been rolled out on a blockchain already. Nobody knows. But still, one may classify it on the basis of the functions performed by them. Just like payment tokens. Just, you know, their name suggests they are used as a medium of exchange of goods or services. Property tokens. Interesting. If you have a right in some property, you can convert that right into a property token. And then you're a owner of that pro property token. Interesting, right? So it's all you can tokenize. Tokenize, a, you know, a, a, a blockchain uh, project which is there on the blockchain. Simple, take an example of your phone. This is your smartphone. Everybody is having it right now. How many apps are there? Assuming that you have not taken the advertisement of Mr. Amitabh Bachchan quite seriously that you just have to keep just dial app on your phone and not any app. Okay. There is an advertisement that comes on the television that why is the need for so many apps? He, he takes, he removes all the apps like this. This app should also go out. This app should also go out. Only just style or, you know, one app should be there. So assuming you have not taken that advertisement seriously and you have numerous apps on your phone, what are they? You have apps on Android. You have several apps on iOS. What is it? One app is doing something else. One app is doing something else. One app is you know, uh, take, taking track of your fitness regime. One app is about your audio, audio books, which you want to read. One app is about music. One app is on, you know, gaming. Everything is doing different function. Every app is doing different function. Just similarly, it's a blockchain technology. Several blocks are there. Several projects are running. They are doing different functions. They are designed to do payments, they are designed to represent property rights in the immovable or movable property. So they are payment tokens or they are property tokens. Similarly, they are utility tokens. Similarly, security tokens. Interestingly, India so far uh, in its securities law does not recognize virtual digital assets as securities so far. Like I've just said, Similar to your phone, on your Android operating system, there are several apps running. On a blockchain technology, there are several projects running. And you can have, you, you know, once you tokenize those projects, you become an owner of this project by investing or by transacting, putting in your money there, and then you get a token. Depending on their function, you name it. So this list can be as much as long as there is no fixed type which can be given to VDS due to their ever evolving nature. Coming to the direct tax implications. Let's understand direct tax implications in two phases. Pre-Union Budget 2022 and post-Union Budget 2022. Pre-Union Budget 2022. Lots of clients from all over India approached us for, you know, whether to classify as capital gains or should you, you know, whether to classify that income as a business income, or if I have my HUF, I am doing some payments there and there and there. I'm, I'm transacting through my HUF, not in my personal capacity, where should I disclose and whatnot. After union budget, 
the air seems to somewhat clear around the taxation regime at least not entirely i would say most of you must be thinking not entirely we, st we still uh, it's there's still a lot of ambiguities i agree there's still a lot of ambiguities there so post union budget 2022 a special tax rate a highest tax rate has been imposed finished before union budget 2022 there is no clear cut guideline or there is no clear cut i would say an instruction from the central board of direct taxes that should you consider your cryptocurrency holdings or holdings in other vdas or nfts as this this type of an asset or this type of an asset that type of an asset it's not a clear cut guideline there is a very old circular somewhere uh, you know released in 1980s on speculative uh, business income somewhere in 1980s or 1990s i'm sorry i'm actually missing the correct year uh, it's going out of my mind right now the correct year but it has it is it's a very age old decade old circular which came for in in 90s or 80s somewhere about speculation or about it clarified that if you are transacting regularly then it should be your business income and if you're transacting let's say uh for an investment purposes one off one one once in a while and you know your your uh your trading patterns are not fixed it's not regular it's not frequent you may consider those as investments and consequently pay tax as capital gains if you sell them similar analogy was drawn to the scenario pre-union budget 2022 that if you're holding cryptocurrency or nfts as your investments then any gains arising from such investments should be your capital gains and if if your transaction if you are a trader or you are you know doing trading you know just like you do it with shares and you are, are quite substantially doing it frequently doing it almost on a daily basis or almost four or five days a week it should be held that the taxpayer is trading making a business out of it you're doing business with it irrespective of the fact that you do it in an individual capacity or you do it through your huf you do it through a partnership firm does not matter the the nature of the transaction is frequency and intent if my intent is to hold something for investment purposes it's a capital asset if my intent is to make gain out of it sell it trade it trade in it it's a business income so before union budget 2022 proposals or now not the proposal finance act 2022 is there this position was considered as prudent after union budget 2022 still there is no clarity only the tax rate the withholding tax provisions the gifting tax provisions and the definition relevant definitions has come in not that to not complete definitions like you have just seen provisos and explanations are there no complete definitions have come in but still somewhat clarity has come in with respect to these tax rates and the withholding tax provisions and gift tax provisions and the definition aspect still they haven't clarified that whether it will be a currency commodity or a security security like i've told you indian securities laws do not recognize cryptos as securities so far it's not a it's not a currency like i've just mentioned it's not a legal tender so as a special tax rate which i will cover in the next slide has already come in it should be classified as separate asset class again similarly what about the period of holding if you know uh if I treat it as capital asset before Union Budget 2022, for example, this FY21-22, the financial year which just got ended, 
uh, on 31st of March 2022, period of holding should be considered as 36 months. You cannot consider it as 24 months or 12 months. Prudent view is to consider it as 36 months. Less than 36 months, it's a short term capital asset. More than 36 months, it's a long term capital asset. Coming to post union budget 2022, section 115 BBH, a special tax rate of 30%, highest tax rate of 30%. And let me tell you, this is not a flat tax rate. This is excluding the surcharge and cess. So the effective tax rate, if you are an individual, let's suppose, and your total income is more than INR 5 crores. Surcharge of 37% gets attracted to you. The effective tax rate will go to for, somewhere to 42.7%. So this much damage has been done by the highest tax rate of 30% on the income arising from the transfer of these virtual digital assets. No deduction apart from the cost of acquisition should be allowed. This is quite clear that whatever the underlying policy or the intent here to tax such new age asset is that we Indians are, or at least from the government point of view, are yet to trust on these new technologies. We haven't trusted, or at least the policy makers seem to not having trusted fully in these new age technologies. And maybe this is the reason that CBDC was announced as well. Central bank digital currency. 30% tax rate sounds similar. You know, winnings from lotteries, Somewhere getting linked, right? Games, shows, you know, these words must be com coming in your mind after hearing 30%. So is this regime similar to taxation of winnings from games, lotteries? Somewhat, you can say, partially, it is similar. No deduction is allowed apart from the cost of acquisition. Interestingly, cost of acquisition is still an ambiguous area. The only clarification that have come in is that the infrastructure setup costs and electricity costs will not be considered as deductible for the purposes of cost of acquisition for the people who do mining business. And let me tell you practically, in India, there are very, very, very mine. It's a very minute number, very petty number who is into mining in India specifically. Very minute number or even not that as well, but very negligible amount of number of people who are into actual mining of cryptos or NFTs. Either people are transacting in it or investing in it. Very, very, very negligible, very petty amount of, of, of the number of people who is into mining. So if you are into mining, what is your cost? Electricity cost. There is a huge amount of electricity cost which goes into mining. Mining is not at all an easy task. Lot of, lot of electricity goes into it electricity costs, infrastructure costs, setup costs, they are not allowed to be deducted. Straight away tax at 30%, what is allowed to be deducted if these for mining business are not allowed to be deducted, then let's come to people who are investing in it. You sell it, you must be incurring some brokerage if you sell it. Is it allowed to be deducted? No clarity. No, no, no guideline and no clarity on this as well. Like I've just mentioned, 
tax rate of 30% and you know for super rich the tax effective tax rate goes up to 43% 42.74% to be precise round off to 43% is damaging in itself with no deduction in respect of any expenditure any expenditure i'll cover brokerage here other than the cost of acquisition or allowance or set off allowed to the assessee in computing the income referred to in 115 bbh so 115 bbh will not allow you to take any deduction in respect of any expenditure please be mindful of this phrase any expenditure other than the cost of acquisition or allowance or set off it's not it allowed no interhead and intrahead set off allowed as well there was an ambiguity which is put to rest recently that fine the section was worded in such a way that sex this income arising from transfer of vda or in case of any loss will not be allowed to be set off under any provision in this act under any provision in the income tax act they have completely completely said no for interhead set off under any provision you cannot set off this loss under any provision of this act fine there was a view that intrahead set off may be allowed because that's not technically set off that controversy has also or that ambiguity has also been addressed that no intrahead will also not be allowed to be set off no carry forward of losses as well so basically section 115 bbh is quite a big section in terms of its applicability no deduction other than the cost of acquisition which is yet to be clarified only clarification so far on cost of acquisition is for the mining business no carry forward no set off under any provision no intrahead no interhead set off no carry forward of loss allowed 30% is not flat 30% plus applicable surcharge and cess let's come to an illustration let's suppose a mr a who is an indian resident purchased 50000 usd tether which is a one of the cryptocurrencies at rupees 67 on 16th of july 2019 he transferred 20000 of USD tether on first of March twenty twenty two, which which falls in which previous year? Previous year twenty one twenty two. Previous year twenty one twenty two is before the Union Budget twenty twenty two, and the remaining in twenty two and twenty three, which will fall after the Union Budget in twenty twenty two. After this FY twenty two twenty three in twenty twenty three. so the tax treatment and the tax implications are going to be completely different how let's see on the table in front of you first is a pre budget scenario 20000 of usdt has been sold for 18 lakh inr the currency here is inr brokerage is 2000 net profit or loss stands at 3 lakh 28173 how you will give an indexation benefit as well if you have held it for more than 36 months ltcg long term capital assets indexation benefit will you will get for fy 2021 2022 20, because 115 bbh applies to previous year 14 starting 14 2022 onwards and this sale or this transaction pertains to the date one Ma first march 2022 so after an indexation net profit or loss comes to 
tax rate at 20% long term capital gain 98450 coming to the asterisk star like i've told you benefit of indexation you can give as 115 bbh is applicable from py 22 23 ay 23 24 sales consideration less cost of acquisition is taxable no doubt on that because we have been given that no other deduction allowed of any expenditure other than cost of acquisition brokerage is any other expenditure in my view brokerage is not your uh, or you cannot uh, brokerage is anyways not your cost of acquisition brokerage is a transfer expense you have you have incurred brokerage at the time of transferring your usd tether not at the time of buying it no set off and carry forward allowed coming to the transactions which happened on 1st 4 2022 and 31st of march 23 both in the financial year 22 23 there is a reason that i have taken both these transactions in the same year to explain the set off and carry forward hit as well which which and uh, which mr a in this illustration will experience 20000 usd has been sold on 14 2022 wherein 115 bbh at 30% is in force brokerage is 2500 10 lakh is the sale price they the it has been sold at a loss of minus 3 lakhs 42000 something 42000 3 lakh 42000 500 what is the tax nil it's a loss situation can you carry forward this loss or you have sold another lot of 10000 usd tether on 31st of march 2023 for around 15 lakhs you have got a net profit straight net profit of 8 lakh 27000 can you set off this 8 lakh 27000 from uh you know the, the can you set up the loss of 3 lakh 42000 from 827000 gain clearly no now clearly no one month back there was an ambiguity but recently a clarification has come in that intra head is also not allowed inter head was anyways not allowed inter intra head is not allowed as well coming to the next illustration on non fungible token mr a has purchased 3000 nfts of uh, let's say there is a very popular nft edition ape 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 monkey you can google it it's a very popular nft uh, you know edition bored bored ape happy ape each ape is unique each ape is different from each other so he has bought 3000 nfts of bored ape edition at 1000 each on 16th of july 2020 which which financial year he has purchased fy 20 21 no 115 bbh nothing is there at this point of time when he purchased this now in py 2223 when a specific tax regime has come in he is selling those nfts 1500 in the lot of 1500 obviously it's his choice he has sold 1500 nft tokens on 1st of april and the remaining on 31st of march one at a consideration of 3 lakhs another at a consideration of 17 lakhs clearly at a profit and a loss situation but see the due to the restriction on setting of intra head loss they cannot even set off the loss from minus 12 lakhs and 2 lakhs so the taxable profit would be 2 lakhs over here and the tax rate would be 30% no deduction for the brokerage like i've told you it's an expense on the transfer it is not the cost of acquisition of those nfts another interesting part gifting we indians or not just indians anybody is likes gifts a lot any everyone on this planet likes gifts 
and even if it is a surprise gift then nothing better than that we all know as per indian income tax act or as per the indian tax regime nobody gifts nobody this is a popular statement from the tax perspective not from the general perspective even i receive gifts in a you know when someone voluntarily wants to give me something it is known as known as a gift when i want to voluntarily gift uh, give someone uh, an a token of appreciation that can be in the form of a gift but in the tax language nobody gifts nobody so that's why there is a tax on it it is not a gift tax gift tax has already been abolished don't go by this word that the gift tax is coming again what is this gentleman by the name of yeshu sagal saying i am not saying it's a gift tax gift tax has been abolished and it has not come back so a sigh of relief here gift tax is not here again but there is a section 56 to 10 which applies whenever any person any person i mean any person irrespective of the residential status resident or a non resident you know any person for that matter receives any benefit whose value exceeds rupees inr 50000 so there is a possibility that after getting a 30% tax rate people may have started gifting vds to each other that's a separate matter that if you gift it to a relative it is still not taxable because 56210 gives immunity to the gifts which is received from a relative under a will or an inheritance or from a trust registered under the income tax act 56210 still gives you immunity but there are a lot of transactions in the crypto ecosystem or the vd ecosystem i would say which is without consideration how tell me how can someone give you a vda without consideration for free air drop tokens a buzzword in the crypto world air drop tokens are nothing but the tokens which has been air dropped the moment you have logged in to the virtual digital asset portal the virtual digital asset ecosystem you'll say okay fine but i did not ask for this gift but still i have received this why to pay tax why to pay tax why i do not have to pay i didn't ask for this gift at all i just logged in there were some promotions going on there was an incentive going on by the cryptocurrency exchanges there was there was a promotional scheme going on on the online portal i was just you know i just got the benefit that's it just i was a part of the ecosystem that's why i got the benefit yes you have answered it yourself you were a part of that ecosystem that's why you have got these tokens which were air dropped on you so air drop is basically you know just to reward you as a community member because these are all you know remember in 2018 i told you mr nishal shetty started a campaign of hashtag india wants crypto to create awareness you know daily a tweet used to happen in this hashtag to create awareness in indians on the cryptocurrency hashtag india wants crypto so this was a straight away a community building up exercise which trusts each other like i am a part of a crypto community for example if my friend is a part of a crypto community you are a part of that community somebody else is a part of the community we are community members we trust this thing we trust this new age asset class that's why we are a part of the same community so we get rewards as part of these community members 
so as in a bid you know as to you know encourage our early adoption or to you know place trust on this new age asset class we get some tokens as a promotional tokens incentive tokens popularly known as airdrop tokens let me tell you if the fair market value of these airdrop tokens exceeds inr 50000 it is taxable in your hands it is taxable in the hands of the recipient you cannot be done away just by saying that i did not ask for it they just gave me no you are a part of the community you place trust in that community you have trust in that idea on the project that's why you have been given a reward and you happily accepted it why not everyone everyone would do that similarly if an individual or any person be it a partnership firm llp hf aop boi donor or donee any status you have if you have received such vdas as gifts and the fair market value of such vdas exceeds inr 50000 it is taxable clearly taxable in your hands coming to the next thing which was there in the budget so to summarize so far simple four things came so far one is a definition of a virtual digital asset has been given second is tax rate at 30% plus applicable surcharge and cess has been given with no deductions other than the cost of acquisition with you know no set off carry forward allowed fourth is the gifting tax provisions has come in in the hands of recipient to you know cover air drop tokens and all fourth one is the withholding tax provision section 194 s is the relevant section for the same so let me first tell you if someone if you know any one of you is having questions so far let's take it up at the end of the uh, you know session because maybe some of the questions would be answered as i progress along the slides withholding tds or you know tds provision cds is withholding only we we use the word withholding for the non residents i work in international tax advisory so we cannot use the word tds if we use the word tds the non resident person won't understand it because tds is an indian word it's a tax deduction at source under the indian income tax laws but to convey our uh, message that this remittance is subject to withholding this remittance is subject to tds at this and so and so rate we use the word withholding so in international tax and in the cross border transactions term withholding is used <clears throat> popularly instead of tds just uh, just a second <clears throat> so a simple 1% rate has come in in section 194 s who is to deduct tds and for whom a big question here right <clears throat> we all know a person who pays or a person who is responsible to pay a consideration or pay an amount has to deduct tds if such payment falls under the relevant sections of the indian income tax act here section 194s let me tell you it only applies to residents it does not apply to non residents so any person who is responsible for paying consideration to a resident has to deduct tds at the rate of 1% flat no surcharge and no cess here if the deductee has not 
given his span a popular funda of 20.8% would apply 20% plus 4% says to be on a safer side applies otherwise 20% as per 206 AA section 206 AA there is an ambiguity on the obligation that who is obligated to pay this tax fine you have mentioned that any person responsible for paying consideration to a resident shall deduct tds at the rate of one percent fine got it coming to the practical scenario which we see in our day-to-day -day tax advisories which we see in our several uh, you know client calls the day these tax proposals were announced i was on for calls for almost two to two and a half hours daily with the clients who are actually either have invested in cryptocurrencies or nfts or who are in who are an exchange or what first of all these tds provisions require a lot of clarity to be given to them because in practical scenario if i am let's say dealing on a cryptocurrency exchange buying a crypto selling a crypto who should i deduct tds for and i like i think whom should I did uh, who for whom should I deduct TDS? Who is the buyer? Who is the seller? I am the buyer, but I do not know who the seller is. There's a practical difficulty here. Buyers and sellers do not know each other. As of now, considering the plain vanilla wordings of the section 194S, the obligation is on the buyer. or it can be on the cryptocurrency exchanges also because there is a limitation that the buyer and the buyer and a seller do not know each other and let me tell you even if the obligation is cast on the cryptocurrency exchange it is going to be practically challenging for an exchange as well because there are huge 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 transactions which happen on the exchange almost on a daily basis people do arbitrage there people do trading there people do buy and selling there p2p lending happens over there and whatnot but what is the impact of this one percent why this one percent has come in 30% tax rate, okay, fine. You wanted to tax, it is booming. Cryptocurrency, uh, you know, India has the highest number of crypto owners. One of the, uh, you know, top countries in terms of the adoption of cryptos. NFT is already on the rise and every Bollywood actor is releasing his or own NFT. Fine, 30% tax rate, no deductions, similar to the taxation of you know, uh, winnings from games, which is there. One person is to trace the transaction. Let me tell you, if we take a global outlook, I am trying to link section 194S, which is a domestic tax law provision applicable only in case of payments to residents. These kinds of payments are basically linked to somewhere anti, you know money laundering or finance terrorism coming to the later slides i would when i'll cover the global developments combating finance terrorism cft anti money laundering these all agencies do appreciate do recognize and do know that these kind of transactions these kind of things can be uh, used either ways. You know, a technology can be used either ways, I would say. So one person provision is to actually 
have a proper trail of the transaction, trace the transaction from where it has been originated and from where it has finished to actually develop a trail here. Obligation is primarily on the buyer or on the cryptocurrency exchanges. Ambiguity is there. A clarification is yet to come in. Time of deduction, similarly, you go to one section 194C contractors, you go to 194J TDS on professional payments, you go to section 194I TDS on rental payments, you come to section 194S for TDS on virtual TDS on payments related to virtual digital assets. Payment or credit, whichever is earlier, is the time of deduction. Let me tell you. There must be payments in kind as well, or there must be payments which are partly in cash or partly in kind. Then how TDS is going to be deducted? Then there the obligation or the onus is on the buyer that the person who is responsible to actually ensure that the tax has been paid if the consideration is wholly in kind. If the consideration is partly in cash, partly in kind, a person responsible should ensure the tax has been paid. This is a gray area, I know, but this is what it is as of now. And the TDS provisions, unlike section 115 BBH, does not apply from 1st April 2022. They apply from 1st of July 2022. There is an exemption as well. I, you know, there must be happy faces now that, okay, fine. There's a lot of ambiguity in section 194S, you know, who is responsible? I either, you know, the onus is on the buyer or on, you know, uh, the cryptocurrency exchanges. We do not know buyers and sellers do not know each other. Oh God, there is an exemption, but there is an exemption, but the threshold is quite lower. There are two thresholds, INR 10,000 and 50,000. If you are a firm or an LLP company, any person other than a specified person, the threshold of 10,000 applies to you. That if the consideration is payable by a firm or an LLP or a company and the value of this consideration does not exceed INR 10,000, do not have you do not have to the firm LLP company do not have to deduct the TDS there. If you are a specified person, then now who is a specified person? This is a very important part of section 194S. I'm telling you who is a specified person, an individual or HUF. Do not bring any third person here while looking at a definition of or while understanding who the specified person is for the purposes of section 194S. It is an individual or an HUF. Again, I'm repeating only an individual or an HUF, not AOP, no BI, only an individual or an HUF whose total sales, gross turnover receipts do not exceed INR 1 crore in case of business and INR 50 lakhs in case of profession during the financial year, immediately preceding the financial end in which you have transferred the virtual digital asset. Or you do not have any other income from business or profession. You don't have any business or profession. Forget about one crore limit. Forget about the gross turnover sales. Forget about the, um, you know, 50 lakhs in case of profession. I do not have, I am a senior citizen. I am an individual, for example, I am a senior citizen. I do not have any income from business or profession. Okay. So the value I can enjoy the TDS exemption if I'm buying and the consideration is payable does not exceed rupees 50,000. If it exceeds 50,000, no exemption. I have tried to summarize the entire threshold limit for the purposes of exemption from section 194S applicability in the table uh, in front of you. Coming to a very interesting point now on the definition of virtual digital asset. Like I've told you, it is a very wide definition. Who have already, you know, read the entire Brayer text with me of 
टू क्लॉस फोर्टी सेवन ए कैन योर डेबिट कार्ड और क्रेडिट कार्ड रिवॉर्ड पॉइंट फॉल अंडर द डेफिनेशन ऑफ वर्चुअल डिजिटल असेट और एयरलाइन माइल्स अवार्ड और you know any such things which you are currently enjoying amazon gift card given by your employer are they all virtual digital assets there is a code for example take an example of amazon gift card there is a code which you scratch on the gift card you mention that code and then you are entitled to use that gift card for the value so it's a store of value do not come to the conclusion straight away please it's a store of value it's a code okay generated through cryptographic means or otherwise any information or number it's a number also it's a number it's a store of value you obviously enjoy if you have got an amazon gift card of 2000 rupees you're definitely going to buy and finish that gift card then and there then and there so is it a vda coming to debit card and credit card points you have got let's say 2000 reward points on cred cred is a popular app used by many of us to pay our credit card payments we get cred reward points we buy anything from the cred club from the cred store utilizing those cred coins giving that differential amount so it's a store of value digital representation of value it's a number or a code generated through cryptographic means or otherwise seems to fall there right prima facie seems to fall there in vda definition airdrop tokens they are already vdas you have already got that while logging into the vda ecosystem if i am sitting here quietly nothing is going to drop me nothing is going to drop over me right I have to be a part of the vda ecosystem through my laptop to log in on the portal then only the tokens would be airdropped on my profile so they are clearly vds debit card and credit card points credit coins they could potentially be get get covered under vda i'm telling you amazon gift card potentially can get covered under vda they have designed this definition so beautifully in so all encompassing manner so you know in you know wide way that even if i take a liberal interpretation you know i am taking a liberal interpretation there are rules of interpretation i am taking a liberal interpretation right now when it comes to for example section 56 to 10 i cannot take a liberal interpretation here you must be thinking that you are taking a liberal interpretation for section 2 clause 47a but then you can say that any vda you give is itself uh, is itself a gift is itself taxable in the hands of recipient section 56 to 10 there i cannot take a liberal view because it is an anti abuse provision section 56 to 10 is an anti abuse provision and anti abuse provisions should be read very strictly other important points for the tds section 194s no tan is mandatory like i've told you the obligation is on the buyer and is there a tds regime or is there a tds section which cast responsibility on the buyer to deduct the tds and there is no tan requirement yes we all know if we buy a property exceeding inr 50 lakh rupees we have to deduct 1% tds right and that 1% tds to deposit that 1% tds 
on behalf of seller does not require tan number at all similarly to pay the tds under section 194s does not require tan number another uh, relief or i would say other uh, you know uh, relief or an important kind of a relief or a welcome move for, from the point of view crypto exchanges is that section 194o which which came for tds for on e-commerce operators it has been clarified in section 194s subsection 8 that if a transaction is subject to tds under section 194o section 194s if the transaction is subject to tax under both these sections clearly the tax shall be deducted under section 194s only and not 194o this is the query this is the practical query which we also received uh, the day these provisions came from our clients that whether 194o would apply or 194s would apply why it would apply why won't it it apply you know blah blah and blah clearly it's a relief i'm telling to cryptocurrency exchanges here that for the cryptocurrency exchanges operating in india section 194s shall apply and the tracks will be deducted in section 194s if the obligation is cast on you and not the buyer presently there is an ambiguity whether it's on the buyer or on the in exchange because if you cast on either of them there are practical difficulties itr disclosures for fy 21 22 the financial year just got ended which just got ended simple simple itr 2 3 3 for business income, 2 for capital gains. If you are having a long term capital asset, long term capital gains that you've sold a VDA after holding it for 36 months, or if you're sold a proper, uh, you know, sold a VDA within a period of 36 months, it's a short term. Otherwise, it's a long term. Under the CG schedule, you need to report. And in case of a business income, you need to report in part A trading account under sale of goods. Net profit would be reported after, you know, reducing the permissible expenses. Here you can obviously take uh, the reduction of the expenses because 115 BBH and a special tax regime is applicable from FY 22 and 23. Other important point here is Schedule FA, which is foreign assets. If you are an individual like I am a resident and ordinarily resident ROR. There is a requirement to report foreign assets under Schedule FA irrespective of my income. Let me tell you, do not confuse it with Schedule AL. Most of you must be confusing it with Schedule AL wherein you need to report your assets and liabilities if your net taxable income exceeds the INR 50 lakhs. No, it's not that. It's a separate Schedule FA foreign assets. If you are an ROR, if you hold any foreign assets, any beneficial interest, any signing authority, any immovable property, any equity, uh, you know, foreign equity and debt interest as well, you need to report it in foreign assets. Is it mandatory? It's a popular question which comes in. Is it mandatory to report in foreign assets? For example, I hold uh, VDAs in, a, in an exchange, Binance, which is a UK based exchange. It's a foreign exchange. They have their servers outside. They do not have anything in India apart from one buyer who is an Indian and who is in India. Yes, though there are no clear guidelines by the CBDT, there are no clear instructions by the CBDT so far, but it is advisable to disclose your holdings in virtual digital assets, cryptos or popularly cryptos or NFTs or any other VDA in your schedule FA, irrespective of your income level, even if it is below exemption limit, then also you should disclose it in schedule FA, in my view. Don't say that, oh, I, I have only got income for 50,000 by two. It is below the exemption limit. No, you have to disclose it in FA. Otherwise, there are a possibility is that you may end up facing some stringent majors in the, uh, you know, under the Black Money Act. It is not under the Income Tax Act, but under the Black Money Act. Again, before saying this, I want to make it amply clear. There are no clear guidelines whether you should disclose them or not. 
it is my view that it is prudent to disclose them because schedule fa is independent of your income level it is independent of your you know uh, you know again uh, your uh, uh, your your income level below 2.5 lakhs or after 2.5 lakhs your net taxable income is uh, you know exceeding 50 lakhs or not schedule fa you should report uh, it is quite it's it's prudent to report here fine but where i have actually produced a snapshot of the latest itr forms which were rolled out by the indian government by the uh, by you know on the income tax portal schedule fa snapshot is there if it is a capital asset it's an asset no doubt a1 is a detail of foreign depository accounts held i don't think it should go over there foreign custodial accounts held no foreign equity and debt interest held clearly no details of foreign cash value insurance contract or annuity contract held no details of financial interest in any entity held now you should go back to the slide where i just deliberated where i deliberated on the types of virtual digital assets on the basis of functions we classify them though there is no standard classification but on the basis of functions we classify vds payment token property token utility token securities token and so on and so forth details of financial interest no details of any other capital asset including any beneficial interest this can go here details of account in which you have any signing authority fine details of trust created no so point so section d is here i'll come back to that section d keep that in mind section g it's a residuary section if you are not able to disclose it in from a to you know f you disclose it in g so section d and section g are relevant for you if you are an ror and if you hold for if you hold assets on virtual digital assets on foreign exchanges it is advisable to disclose them again i'm putting there is no guideline or there is no instruction to disclose but it is a prudent view to disclose them in your itr coming to the section d it says country name if i am having on binance uk zip code i'll be getting it nature of asset virtual digital asset ownership direct beneficial or beneficiary as the case may be date of acquisition you know the day the day you have actually invested there total investment at cost income derived from the asset nature of income and simple simple details similarly lesser amount of details in section g as compared to section d simple details to be put here please either go for d either go for g prudent view is to if i have to compare between d and g proper disclosure would be in d <clears throat> again this is subject to the debate <clears throat> i'm sorry challenges still there are a lot of challenges like calculation of fmv for the purposes of section 56210 56210 what it is it taxes gifts in the hands of recipient if it it if it taxes gifts in the hands of the recipient then fmv exceeds 50000 fmv how to calculate fmv there is no rule rule 11 ua is there for the unlisted shares what about fmv and the rule so there is an ambiguity over here to calculate or the manner in which the fair market value should be calculated crypto to crypto trading it's in the crypto market just a minute in the crypto market there is a possibility or a common practice that you exchange your crypto with another crypto for example i give you my bitcoin and you give me your ethereum both are cryptocurrencies but who is a seller and who is a buyer in this uh, transaction you have given me your bitcoin i have given you my ethereum for example or vice versa so i am a seller also and i am a buyer also and you are a seller also in some way and the buyer also in some way then whom to deduct tds for and how to deduct tds and on whom the obligation is there we both are the buyers in the same transaction we both are the sellers in the same transaction 
so the crypto to crypto trading and the tds nuances associated with it needs to be clarified or you can say this slide where is actually reflecting the unaddressed or the gray areas where finance act 2022 was silent valuation issues crypto uh, is a highly volatile asset class or vda is a highly volatile asset class it's quite complex so valuation uh, rules proper valuation mechanism needs to be put in place in the domestic tax law equalization levy coming to the indians transacting on the foreign exchange like binance in uk if i am transacting as an indian user on the foreign exchange the equalization levy came in finance came through finance act 2020 wherein the scope was widened to levy 2% on the consideration received by e-commerce operators who supply e-commerce services to a person resident in india or to a non resident or to any person who buys goods or services through an internet protocol address situated in india so indian users transacting on foreign exchanges could be subject to equalization levy again this is not yet clarified not yet addressed but equalization levy is an issue there gst challenges i think the next clarification which should come in the virtual digital asset space is the gst regime income tax regime they have similar they have somewhat you know come up with they have somewhat you know cleared the air around that but the gst regime should be somewhat the next thing for the indian government esops endless possibilities i am telling you these are new age asset classes if you give shares in the esops you can give cryptos you can give vdas as the stock options or you can give him you know uh, you know i would say uh, any incentive to your employee what about the taxation of those uh, you know arrangement what about the taxation of those transactions it's a gray area cost of acquisition it's a very important it's a very very important deliberation on cost of acquisition here like there is no deduction allowed other than cost of acquisition if there is no deduction allowed other than cost of acquisition then what actually is the cost of acquisition when in case of mining business the government has clearly clarified the infrastructure setup electricity cost won't be uh, won't be deductible for the purposes of arriving at the cost of acquisition then what actually is the cost of acquisition in section 43 in indian income tax act at present there is actual cost for the assets you know for you know building for your computer you know for the for the wdv purposes in the pgvp section section 43 one is the actual cost similarly to my view a section should be incorporated in the domestic tax laws of india to clarify what actually the cost of acquisition is for the virtual digital assets because that's the only benefit you there's the only benefit we as investors we as traders get i'm sorry period of holding is another area if i have received a vda as a gift should i consider we a uh, period of holding of a previous owner as well or not or if yes in what circumstances or if not then in what circumstances cryptocurrency exchanges there is a need of uniform kyc regulations it should not be like there is one format for one you know internally designed by one exchange and one format internally designed by one exchange it should not happen like that there should be a uniform kyc regulation form which should be same across all the exchanges to maintain the actual transparency in the system concerning the kyc in combating finance terrorism terrorism and money laundering transactions cost of acquisition in case of crypto to crypto tran transfer again above i covered crypto to crypto trading now it's a crypto to crypto transfer what is the cost of acquisition like i have sold you my uh, bitcoin and you have given me your ethereum 
how can you say that this costs certain amount of uh, you know amount to me and this you can say this costs certain amount to, to me it's a highly volatile market prices fluctuate like anything in a matter of seconds in a flick of seconds there has to be proper like i've said for cost of acquisition we have section 43 in the domestic tax laws of india there should be one section which in my view should be there for cost of acquisition for virtual digital assets or a section which should actually tell the manner in which the cost of acquisition should be computed for such virtual digital assets another point is the taxation of nris i'm not saying non residents over here i'm saying non resident indians over here nris let me tell you this this forms one of the important chunks one of the important areas where they actually you know the india is becoming uh, the top countries in terms of crypto investments where non resident indians are also investing there in this crypto space i have sold i am a non resident indian for example i have sold a virtual digital asset on a an on an exchange which is outside india they have their servers outside india should i uh, be liable to tax in india section 51d clearly says of indian income tax act 1961 that in case of nris or you know people who are nrs only india sourced income is taxable so if they have their servers located outside india if if their entire income or a loss whatever the transaction outcome is has happened outside india in my view they are not liable to tax or they should not offer they don't have to offer to tax this income in india however a much needed clarification or a rationalization in section 5 wherein we also check the accrual the legal right to receive such payment and etc facts in the indian income tax laws should be there or should come in coming to the global developments there is a lot of things which are happening across the world when we go for key developments around the world united states of america crypto exchanges in us and not cryptocurrency crypto exchanges falls under the bank secrecy act over there so for federal income tax purposes internal revenue service irs classifies cryptocurrencies as property wherein if i say if i look at canada then canada is the first country to approve bitcoin exchange trading fund and they also from taxation point consider them as commodities some consider as properties some countries consider as commodities india is considering them as you know virtual digital assets uk again considers uh you know it's taxability on the basis of a property because it is not a legal tender anywhere japan considers cryptocurrency again as a legal property under the payment services act over there australia again classifies as a legal property which makes them subject to capital gains tax but again not a legal tender one thing which is common again uh, in the global developments is the attempt to actually combat finance terrorism and the money laundering aspects which get as which gets linked to it as well what is the way ahead like i've told you india has announced central bank digital currency its own currency sovereign bank by rbi by indian government can it you know what can it serve the purpose of being decentralized in nature because the entire aim or the entire objective of bitcoin or cryptocurrency or vd is that they are decentralized in nature but if a cbdc will come in it will be a regulated currency by rbi as a counterpart to the indian currency notes which are there at present there is no use case so i won't be <coughs> i'm sorry there is no use case as of now for these cbdcs but 
there is a possibility that it the decentralized nature will be diluted from that and if the decentralized nature would be diluted the entire objective of the virtual digital assets blockchain technology somewhere takes a second seat so it is an interesting thing or an interesting proposition announced by the honorable finance minister nirmala sitaraman ji which is you know which which i think the times the coming times will tell how this is going to be turn how this is going to turn out for the indians or you know uh, the investors or traders however one thing which is very important to be you know mentioned over here while concluding my presentation is india is finally opening up to the new age asset class from 2019 to outrightly banning it to at least coming up or recognizing it through a taxation regime not legally it is still not legal it is still not regulated there is a, there is no regulation no concrete regulation it's all a draft bill which is there but at least india government indian government has opened up to taxing it considering it that this is the booming space this is the new age asset class which has emerged with this i'll finally conclude my presentation and thank you so very much for giving me your precious time and chamber of tax consultants study circle for this wonderful opportunity of presenting myself on the topic or speaking on the topic of taxation of virtual digital assets which is very close to my heart this is about me i express my gratitude towards all of you for such patient hearing for a couple of hours with me you can join me or you can you know get in touch with me on the email id which is there you can join me on my youtube channel you can join me on linkedin or you can join me on an instagram as well so these are the email ids for your kind per usual i issue can you just see this question can you please explain again income tax return slide yeah sure 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 so itr disclosure is for fy 21 22 because the special tax regime is applicable from 22 23 py ay 23 24 so if you have held those assets as investments you need to report it under the cg schedule of itr 2 slash itr 3 if you are having uh, if you have held these assets as your you know um, you as a trader as a as, as a stock in trade you need to report this under business income after taking the permissible deductions of the expenses and in case you have held it, those under the investment reported under under the cg schedule short term long term as the case may be period of holding should be 36 months be considered for arriving whether a particular asset is a short term capital asset or a short term capital gain or a long term capital gain long term capital asset as the case may be and if treated as business income you need to report in itr 3 the sale of cryptos in part a trading account under the sale of goods and the net profit should be arrived after reducing the permissible expenses and if you are an ror uh, filing it in the individual capacity make sure ensure to actually disclose your vda holdings in the schedule fa also Uh, ma'am i have some questions in front of me one second you... issue i think sujo mehta wants to uh, yeah. talk yeah please yeah. sujo thanks yeah thanks uh, thanks issue for this clarification just just a follow up uh, uh, question on this if we show as a business income so uh, once we show that as a business income i am i am assuming the uh, the we can take the losses also Uh, uh since it will be taxable as net profit so the uh, if, even the losses would be taken care in this situation if i disclose that as an a business income nice question 
but you know we need to see the intent the underlying intent is that they have disallowed the losses already in the new in the special tax regime correct so yes. if the intent was to give the benefit of losses or there was some comfort of the government to give some respite to the uh, you know taxpayers who are you know treating it as stock and trade or investments then the losses part should have been allowed in the special tax regime as well however that does not mean that you should not take into account the losses in term in whether reporting it as business income or not you can prudently you should not okay okay so ideally a two demat account or something a two accounts would be an ideal scenario to prove yeah but at the end of the day you have to aggregate both of them okay okay thank you thank you Uh, next question issue is how to get the details of the purchases. Details of the purchases or purchases on the exchanges. You must have converted your fiat money into you know the 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 the, the currency in the wallet on the exchange, and then on the orders tab, whenever you log in your account, you have to see the orders. <coughs> If you any exchange you you are using, uh, you know. on the app based or through your website on the orders there are definitely dates of it so the dates on which you have placed an order should be your date of purchase on uh, the next question is how to prove with the dip tax department about the cost of acquisition it's an interesting it's an interesting thing because cost of acquisition is nowhere uh, clarified so far and like i've already told it is one of the benefits or one of the important deliberations that there should be an important uh, you know section in the domestic tax law which should clarify or a notification should which should clarify what actually is the cost of acquisition as of now cost of acquisition should be your purchase price that's it whenever you let's suppose whenever you log in or whenever you become a part of the vda ecosystem you pay numerous charges like gas fees you pay membership fees you pay conversion fees you pay the you know you pay the you know you buy an asset for the particular price you pay that price as well there is no clarity whether you should consider gas fees membership fees conversion fees in the cost of acquisition there is actually a benefit of doubt which a taxpayer can take however cost of acquisition according to me should be the amount which is directly attributable to that asset so if you are if you have paid gas fees or a membership fees to become a part of that vda ecosystem that does not form part of your cost of acquisition because you cannot directly attribute it to that asset price so the cost which you think are directly or can be directly attributable to the asset should be the cost of acquisition in case of mining like mining in india very you know negligible amount of people are into mining so infrastructure and electricity they are not deductible clarified already our uh, next question is regarding uh, can we claim interest payable on the borrowing made from the relatives against the profit i will have to check that i'll have to check that and get back on it i think it would be uh, somewhere same uh as you responded about the cost of acquisition because there's no clarity on that there is no clear cut guidelines but no some analogies and some harmony needs to be there so we need to check that basically whether we can do that or not right and i think uh, there is also a lot of challenge about just to uh, tell you about this that uh, the services which are getting paid in the form of cryptos mm -hmm. the invoices of the services or the goods which are being paid in the form of cryptos there there is a lot of challenge about the cost of acquisition about the taxability how to value them it's going to be very difficult in those cases as well absolutely correct absolutely correct so that's why i say it's only if you if you see it's only four things that have come up the definition of vda the tax rate and uh, the withholding provisions and the it is taxable in the hands of recipient under 56210 only four things it's a gradual process i believe and a lot is yet to come a lot yes absolutely so the next question
question is uh, where the assessee received the notice, but those exchange closed. How the cost can be proved in those cases? Again, uh, a benefit of doubt can be taken. If an exchange has been closed, you must have been, you know, uh, kept some kind of a documentation or you must have kept some, there should be some entries in your bank account where you have done your transaction from and all. Take those dates, take those amounts and, you know, uh, do some maths, do some maths around it. And th that is how you should do it in, in case, in cases where exchanges have been closed and nothing is there on record now. And uh, the next question is, uh, can we, uh, no, just sorry. In case of TDS, 194S will override other sections. So one has to deduct 1% instead of 10% under 194J. Can you please repeat this question? Sorry? Can you please repeat this question, ma'am? Yes, yes, sure. Uh, it's saying that in case of TDS uh, under 194S, Will it override the other section? So one has to deduct 1% instead of 10% under 194J. No, no, no. It is a non offsandic clause attached to it. 194S shall apply, not 194J. Yes. Um, the next is department has only information based on searches conducted that the SSC has on on account of sale, but about the purchase since the exchange closed, how to prove the cost? I think you already answered mm -hmm. about it. Right. And uh, then the next is can bank statements suffice? They, they form they they form a they form a part of your uh, supporting documents. Whether they can suffice or not, that's a call of an assessing officer, but. They form a part of your documentation. They form a part of as a response to the questionnaire if you get that. And I think the last question is about the GST implication on VDA. I'm not sure whether that's the right thing to ask. It, at is, this it, it is the next thing which should which is expected to come yeah. out, uh, uh, you know, anytime soon. It it is it, it. I think the next thing, the next clarity which the government should come up or the next development which should take place in the VDA uh, VDA system is. Uh, is on GST only. Yes. So thank you so much, Yishu. It was really wonderful presentation and wonderful lecture.